you developed the name mm -hmm. Lights Out from one specific game that happened in high school. I ended up knocking out four kids in, in the game. I was a kid that was like using football to vent, to like get it, to escape what I was dealing with at home and my, my surroundings. And so I learned how to play that way. So that was the only way. I didn't want to tackle you and get you to the ground. I wanted to hurt you. And I wanted to inflict pain. I wanted to go over and beyond what my calling was to do on that play. What was a day or a time in your life where you hit a low, low, and it was hard to come back from? The eviction notice on the door. And me, my mother, my sister, we, uh, we went to sleep in, in the back of a car. Then we went to a shelter. I don't remember days I didn't feel like I was gonna make it. It was just tougher to figure out. Honestly, I never can rem remember a day where I'm just like, I, I'm not, I can't do it. I'm not gonna make it. It was just certain days it was like, oh, okay, this one's a bad day and this different from that bad day. Was there ever a scenario where you felt like you had to protect your mom? I was uh, 14 and she had a boyfriend at the time. He also sold drugs. I told him like, hey, look, I don't care what you do, but keep it away from my sister and my mom. And you know, he had a problem with a 14 year old kid telling them that. And we were in the room and he kind of got in my face and said, what are you gonna do about it? And I said, practically don't bring those drugs around my mother and my sister. And that's the last time I'm gonna tell you. He said, you telling me? And I just beat him up. I beat my mother's boyfriend up. This is an episode with Sean Lights Out Merriman. For me personally, this episode was a dream. Sean was somebody that I idolized coming up through high school, playing football. And in fact, his celebration was the celebration that I would do when I would make a big play uh, playing free safety. Sean's an incredible dude. Uh, you know, he talks about experience that he had in high school where for several years, him and his mom and his sister actually lived in a car. And so when colleges started coming out to recruit him, they wouldn't let him come because he didn't want them to know that he didn't have a home to stay in. But he didn't, he doesn't complain about it. Just his attitude towards the way that he was brought up. He's very grateful for being brought up that way. And, you know, having a mother that worked multiple jobs just to put food in their bellies. Talks about an experience in high school where he got the nickname Lights Out because he knocked out multiple players in the same game unconscious. And, you know, talks about his, his rise and then fall in the NFL. So welcome to another episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Strap in and thank you for being here. Sean Merriman, welcome to the Roller Coaster Podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you, you being here. So for those who don't know Sean, um, Sean's actually one of my one of my idols from high school. He's a guy that I looked up to a lot playing football. And you developed the name, speaking of high school, mm -hmm. lights out from one specific game that happened in high school. Yeah. What happened in that game? I um I ended up knocking out four four kids in, in the game. Um but you know, that was back pre-social media, pre all this stuff, what became like a folktale. You know, like, you know, people like, hey, do you hear about the guy that was over at Frederick Douglass High School knocking people out, you know, knocking kids out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so after that game, I had about, you know, twenty or twenty five students come run up to me and say, you, you knocked those kids lights out. And I looked at everybody and was like, Yeah, you don't call me lights out. And I didn't I didn't think the name was gonna stick. And Monday I got to school and everyone's calling me lights for lights out. That's when I went to go get this uh, lights out tattoo. You know, it took me about two weeks to convince my mother to let me go get this tattoo, uh, and she did. And then it became like a persona, it came uh, like a character. Yeah. You know, there was just like this f guy that's flying around, taking people heads off the field, like got to dance and everything else. It just came a part of who I was, really. That's got to be a record when you think about like we 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 had a. You hear about guys knocking a guy out once in a season, maybe twice in a season if yeah. you're ferocious, but four times in one game. You've never heard of that before, right? No, and it's it's never really happened. And I, I think a, a lot of that too started because I, that's how I learned to play the game, right? And you know, I, we we talked briefly before we got on it, like my my upbringing in PG County, Maryland, some of the things I was going through. I was like, 
I was a kid that was like using football to vent, you know, to like get it to escape what I was dealing with at home and my my surroundings. And so I learned how to play that way. So that was the only way. I didn't want to tackle you and get you to the ground. I wanted to hurt you. And I wanted to inflict pain. I wanted to 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 go over and beyond what my calling was to do on that play because that was how I learned how to play the game. Yeah. So when I was in high school, I played free safety. I played in Utah at 200 pounds, and I could run a little bit. But my deal was – same thing. I was trying to take your head off. 200 pound free safety in high school is big. Big, right? yeah. So when I would, and I'm going to find, <laughs> I'm going to have to find the film, right? This wasn't that long ago, but it was long, long enough, enough to where it. it's not, it's not as readily really available enough. as it is today. So my deal was this deal, right? Yeah. Okay. Where did that come from? That came from I, you. So yeah. where, t- tell me the story I, about I, how I, you um, developed that. So, you know, like growing up, man, I think that. <laughs> Like I was one of the ones I had the the uh, headband around my neck, and I was you know doing a prime time Deion Sanders dance. You scored, so I was always like a fan of like characters, personalities, yeah. big players, right? Like that they made me want to play the game. Um, and so when I got the the lights out tattoo on my right forearm, it was my first game against Georgia Tech uh, when I was at the University of Maryland, my my freshman year. ESPN first first it was a night game, never played on a big stage like that. Um, and I got in the game, I was dropping the coverage, and a wide receiver come, come running across the middle, and I just deck him, hit him. Watkins uh, was the wide receiver, came across the play, and it was a big – it hits on YouTube. It was a big hit, and I got up and kind of just pointed at the light switch. And the crowd, which I didn't expect to happen, the crowd got loud, and I started to kind of jump a little bit. With <laughs> it, was, it was totally – I wasn't expecting just it. Just organic, It yeah. was organic. Um, and I got to – my coach ganked me out the game. Coach Ralph Friesen yanked me out the game and, and told me if I ever did it, did that again, I would never play again, ever. So I went from high to low. Like, oh, God damn, my coach pissed off, right? Um, I got to the sideline and my other coaches, my teammates were slapping me on the head, slapping me on the back. You know, there's no feeling better than making a big play and everybody's kind of jumping on you or whatever. I say, what was that dance that you was doing? And I said, oh, it's this lights out dance. And that stuck. <laughs> It just stuck, man. So I, a lot of this stuff, I can say, you know, like yeah, the name and all that stuff was planned, but everything that came after that, it was, it was all organic. Yeah, it's almost like, I mean, are you turning that light switch on and off? Is that I'm what just you're flicking doing? Flicking the light yeah, switch, flicking, yeah, flicking the light switch. So on. for those who are listening that that aren't watching, that can't see this on Sean's right forearm, inside forearm, he literally has a light switch like you would see in a house with a finger that's turning it off. Right. So and and at the top, it says lights out. I mean, that's that's gangster. What do you think made you you, like special as a linebacker? So let's stay on football for a little bit. Yeah, I think um, more more so than anything outside of obviously you got to be blessed with some physical attributes. Right. You got to be big, (laughs) got to be strong and fast, which I was which I was blessed with. But then again, you get around you start getting around bigger talent. That's also they have that when I started to see the separator is is the mindset right the the willingness to go far and beyond everybody else and and i've always had that i've always had that for that was that was not taught um if you ask anybody ask anybody that watched me even 10 years old i had that i had a different mindset i have a different mentality than everybody else that was around me and then i started coming to my own physically so now you got the mentality that I had, you know, the work ethic. I wanted to push, push as hard as I can possibly push everything that I did. Just started timing up with my body kind of maturing and me coming into my own. And those two worlds just clash, man. And I never really, I never really looked back since. That mindset, you said you were blessed with it. I mean, do you believe that mindset's more DNA or do you think this is something that you can develop? Is it based on things we've gone through? I think um, I think it's two things. I think that what you go through in life builds that foundation to be able to take your mind to a different place, right? Mm-hmm. Because we talked about injuries, talking about a lot of this stuff. Well, y- your mind can also get injured your, because of what's going on throughout your life. So you kind of have these mental battles of I'm not going to make it because of my situation or my yeah. circumstance. So you can get negative on that and, and, and lay on that. Or you can start finding like that 10 percent is positive in your life and hang on that. Right. A lot of people, I think that. They start looking at if you got a dark cloud or you're going through something, they start automatically looking at all the worst things that's going on around you. They don't look at that little 
that little piece of positivity that they got. They don't look at that little piece of like something that's gonna get you out of bed or get you up the next day to get you working again. And they they hang on just to the to the dark and the negative and everything else. But if you eating that day, right? And this was this what comes to that mindset that if you got a, if you got a place to live, you got food that day. That that's your ten percent of positivity that you need to get up and keep going the next day because somebody out here doesn't have that. And so you have to start hanging your hat on whatever that whatever positivity you got in that one particular situation. Thank you to our sponsors over at Bucked Up. I love this company. I love their products, their apparel, and their supplements. Recently, they dropped the mother of all pre-workouts, Mother Bucker. This is not for the faint of heart. This will make you want to claw your face off. So don't get stuck in traffic when you're headed to the gym. I love these guys. I love this company. And I love their products. They are clearly the best tasting pre-workout on the entire market. And they're number one for a reason. Bucked Up is my favorite workout brand, hands down. And they also have my favorite apparel for working out and just for daily life. It's Lululemon-like quality, but for a fraction of the price that's affordable. So head over to their site, buckedup.com, where you can check it out. And for 20% off their entire site, Use the code Tyler Hall twenty. I'm guessing that there were times <clears throat> where you weren't all, always perfect, right? With your mindset, mm -hmm. there's probably times where you dwelled on some of these things longer than you should have. Yeah. What What was a day or a time in your life where you hit a low, low, and it was hard to come back from it? Um. I, I would say that um, that coming coming home and we had the eviction notice on the door and me and my me and my mother and my sister we uh we went to sleep in the, in the back of a car me we, i saw me i my mom slept in the front seat me and my sister slept in the back of the car then we went to a shelter then we went to um like some low budget motel six or eight i forgot the numbers but we went to stay in those for a while until we really got back on our feet and they, I, I don't remember days I didn't feel like I was going to make it. It was just tougher to figure out certain days. Like, I never, I honestly, I never can rem remember a day where I'm just like, I, I'm not, I can't do it. I'm not going to make it. It was just certain days. It was like, oh, okay, this one's a bad day and it's different from that bad day. It'd be a lot less straightforward. Yeah. yeah. And so this one's going to be a little bit harder to figure out than this, or this might take a little bit longer to figure out than this or to get over, right? Um, and so I, but I, I never really had those days where I never felt like I was going to make it. I never really, not one day went by where I, I just can't, I'm, I can't, you know, I'm not going to make it out of this one. Yeah. I'm not going to make it past this time, you know, and even eviction notes, I knew that at some point the government was going to kick us in and give us some money, right? Like enough to get back into another apartment or something. It was just a matter of time. I never felt like we were not going to be in a better situation. Can you describe what that feels like sleeping in the back seat of a car with your little sister and your mom in the front? Yeah, so I think the the biggest thing for me, um, and you go back and obviously thank for my mother for my mother around those times because she had to be very street smart, right? Around because you're a woman, you got two kids, so you got to know how to maneuver a little bit different than if you were a man, right? Yeah. Somebody out here that can protect a little bit more. So my mother was very street smart, um, but I also remember the times where we found we were laughing like it was it, i guess what 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 is a, a a comic called it's like a it's like what like a comedy relief right where your situation is just terrible you just laugh it out and you just <laughs> laugh it out you know it was like nobody like you just find a way to laugh at that moment but you're laughing at pain you know you don't get you wrong you're hurting you want to cry a little bit yeah but you're also you're laughing um you're, you're laughing differently to a situation because you know it's going to get better, right? You know, at some point, this is, just a, this is a period in mm -hmm. your life. So when you know things are going to get better at some point in time, then you can laugh it out. And I tell people all the time now, for that situation I lived into, lived at that current time, like good times don't last forever and neither is bad. So if you know that you, the good times are not lasting forever, then you know the bad times are not either. So it was, I was... We were capable of laughing in those moments, you know, um, when we didn't, we couldn't afford, uh, we couldn't afford gloves. And my sister got, you know, we got two pairs of socks 
on our hands, right? But one of the one of the socks got holes in it, so your thumb go. You know, we cutting holes so your thumb can go through the through the sock. Um, but I think that if you're if you're able to find some comedy in that, knowing that those tough times are not going to last, and you know you can make it you can make it through anything. I want to keep drilling on this, right? Because I think that there's, I mean, there's a lot of people going through it. There's a lot of people in pain yep. these days. It's, and sometimes it's financial pain. Sometimes it's spiritual. It could be religious. It could be health. And I, I don't know if you knew this or not, Sean, but the suicide rate among men is higher than it's ever been in the history of the world yep. right now, right? 80% of suicides are men, okay? Not women. Mm -hmm. It's not talked about very often, but that's that's the data, right? A lot of times what happens with men is they carry the, essentially the weight of the world is on their shoulders. Yep. They have so many things to carry and to think about. They don't ever feel like they can openly share and be vulnerable. It's one of the reasons we talk about some of the things that we do. So what happens? It gets so heavy. This mountain of stuff becomes so heavy, starts compressing their spine. And they think that the only way to solve it is to end their life. Mm -hmm. What do you say to men who right now are out there going, dude, this is just too much. I can't I, sleep in the back of my car. I can't go through this yeah. physical ailment. I can't go through this. I can't deal with this financial hurt. I think um, you know, the, m most men feel like that because of they carry the weight of doing for people. And the second you can't do for somebody, you're worthless in, in a lot of people's eyes. It's calling a spade a spade. Right. Yeah. Um, if you can't pay this bill, you can't take care of your family, you can't provide, can't do this, can't do that. You're worthless. And that that is what a lot of men f feel, you know. And so I I get that feeling because, you know, I've been in a situation where I took have taken care of a lot of people in my life. Right. Family, friends. I've taken a lot of people. And the second I say no. Damn. You know, you kind of start to see who people really are. Yeah. Um, so you got to look at it two ways. Right. And 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 by the by the way, sharing. The truth of the matter, most people don't care anyway. So if you go and you tell somebody, hey, I'm struggling yeah. because you can't provide or you can't do this, they don't care anyway. That's the truth. And so you have to be okay with people not caring, right? And I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying be okay with it to the point where it's not going to affect you in your daily life, knowing that you are more than what these people are desiring, mm -hmm. desiring from you. Mm -hmm. You're a person. And it's okay to say no. It's okay to say, I can't do this. And this is something I had to learn early in my career. I got drafted at 20 years old, right? Uh, so, you know, I saw my first bit of real money at 20. So you got to expect all the people that was around me, what can you do for me? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of that. And yeah. so, you know, by my second year in the league, I got really, really confident with saying no. I mean, I was the best at saying no, <laughs> you know, and, and go and roll right over and go to sleep. No problem. Yeah. You know, but I used to feel, when I, my rookie year, I would feel bad, you know, if I couldn't pay a bill. I would feel bad if somebody in my family or friend car got repoed and I couldn't give them that five or six hundred bucks to pay for their whatever that month yeah. or grand or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that was a weight on me. And did I realize that you don't you don't owe these people anything? You don't. But people can make you feel that way. So when you when you start to see these suicide rates hired by men, it's for one, they feel like when they can't do something for you anymore, you're not you're worthless. And so as long as men know that, you know, you're, you're, you're worth, you know, you were, you are worth something where you can do something on somebody if you're not um, and be OK with it. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm just saying you have to be OK with feeling OK about all of that. You can't provide. You can't do. Yep. And it's true. It's true, man. Like for the most part, you know, people don't care anyway. You can you can say you're stressed or you got anxiety, you're depressed and people still look at you and say, what, you, what can you do for them? And if you can't do it, and that's when you got to be okay as a man and say, okay, well, I can't do it. Now, now what? Yeah. What are some of the things you think? <clears throat> I don't know if you've if you've dealt with any of this, depression, anxiety, stuff like this throughout your life. But mm -hmm. when you start having some of those negative thoughts and you start spiraling, like what are the things that you start to do in your life that helps you battle these demons? You you have to um everybody gotta find an anchor or balance, whatever that is. For me, it's a gym. Right. Yeah. You know, we just talked about I still uh I go and spar with some of my fighters. I go spar the boxes, you know, even if it's three rounds, three, three minute rounds. I'm in a gym this morning. You know, if you look at my IG, um I, at five o'clock in the morning, I'm at a gym. Cause I wanted to get a workout in before my flight so I can set my day up for success. Yeah. Right. So whatever anxiety you, you wake up with or stress, you get that out first. Or 
if you're going through that, go take you an hour and a half and go get you a nice workout in, out and, and sort out the rest of your day if you're starting to feel that way. But certain other people may be reading. They may be meditating. So you, you find whatever that balance is for you and you do that. And then you make sure you block out everything else because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. Yeah. And that's that's the truth. And so if you're spiraling and you're going through something, you find out whatever that anchor is to get you balanced again and get you recalibrated. You go do that for an hour or two and block out everything else. And if people, I don't care if it's friends, family, you block out everybody. Because if you're not able to take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. You just can't. Sean, you grew up in a, what I would say is a less than average situation that you were sort of born into, if yeah. you will. There tends to be some common themes with athletes that grew up in a situation like yours. Mm -hmm. A lot of times these are the guys that become the greats in my opinion, right? Mm -hmm. And there's there's edge cases like there is with anything. But what do you think it was about growing up in the ghetto in DC, yep. metro, drug infested violence? I mean, seeing that from a young age, what did that do to you? Because as easily as you got out, Probably the the statistics say that you're going to get stuck in that. You're never going to make it out. So how yeah. did, how did you navigate your way out of that situation? I, I think the the biggest thing for me and all the stuff that we went through and, and and by the way in like the late mid the late 80s and 90s, Washington D.C. and that area that I was in was crack infested, crime, heavy high crime. Probably I think top five or top seven in the country wow. as far as crime. Wow. Um, but I think that, you know, you always, when you're going through something bad, you don't see the silver lining. You don't see the positive side of it, right? You're just worrying about what you're going through right now. Um, and you're talking about, you know, athletes from those type of environments being the best at what they did. Well, I truthfully believe because you've already been through the worst and you had to figure it out. You know, certain things that would kick somebody else down because they had a bad day, a bad week, a bad month. I was like, no, no, you don't know what a bad week looked like. You know, come home with eviction notice on the door. Your, your lights is off. You, you don't have food in there. The the your uh, EB the, <laughs> the EBT card didn't come yet, or the you know, the wig the wig vouchers didn't kick in. Like you don't know bad. Your right? pain tolerance your pain is much tolerance higher. is much higher. And yeah. I think that you know a, a lot of times what happens is people get caught into life, and life can kick your ass sometimes. And so, so when somebody's been through that environment, they've been through the ringer already. Somebody else's bad day is not my bad day, right? Just because somebody else's car doesn't start up or something very, very minute, very small happened to them. And they're like, oh, I can't believe this is happening to me. And, you know, me, I'm like, oh, you know, until you not have food in there, right? Or no lights, or you're sleeping in the back of a car, you're sleeping at some low budget motel, roach infested motel. Like, until you see that. Yeah. What you're going through is not that bad. And so you don't see the silver line of these things until you get on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. What was the worst thing you saw as a kid growing up in that environment? Mm. Um, one of the worst um, things is I, I saw my, um, my one of my mom's really good friends get shot. We were We were coming home late at night. And, um, you know, when it's dark outside, you know, these buildings, all the, in the, in the projects, all the buildings are, are close in, in the proximity, right? Like there's literally almost stacked on the top of each other. It was yeah. dark. So we were coming around the corner and, and I heard my mom's friend. I was with my sister and my mom and we saw two, three, three gunshots go off and the sparks, you know, kind of fly up. So the, the, the side of the building light up. Right. And, um, we came over there and, and her friend was laying down on the on the ground. Turns out my mother knew the shooter too. So they all were friends and she saw it. And this is when I talk about my mother was very, a lot of common sense and street smarts because the, the guy who shot saw that my mother saw it. And my mother actually invited him up 
to our apartment to come hang out and just like everything was cool. Because if we act, oh my God, we just saw someone get shot. She's gonna be next. She's gonna be next, or we're gonna be next. Yep. So her playing it really cool, um, she invited him up. And he, I remember he went into the bathroom. He must've had blood or something on his hands or something because he went into the bathroom, he was washing his hands. I'm assuming it was- She invited blood. him up that night? Right after, like we didn't see anything happening. And she just kind of played it off. She invited him up for two, not even two minutes after it happened. But she was quick in her feet like that, right? Because she wanted to show that it's not that big. We didn't see anything. Yeah, come up and, you know, if you need to use the bathroom or something, come use our place. She invited him up, him up to the apartment. So I remember as a kid, I was walking by the bathroom door. And I do, in fact, I, now that I see, I remember seeing the blood in, in the sink and washing hands, his hands off with blood on it. Um, but my mother was so smart at that time. She, um, the guy came over, he had like a, a drink or something like that or something of like a soda, took off and left, put his, put his, put the gun back in his back pants and, and left the house. But you know, that, at that time she was very smart because she didn't react to what we just saw. It was almost like, Hey, if you need to come up and you know, he did. And we didn't, at the time, you know, we didn't know if he was going to be cool, if he was going to come up and execute all of us because we, well, what we just saw, you know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, but again, that's not, you know, a lot of stories like that, you know, not sometimes not even involving just me, but of what I was around or what I was, you know, kind of exposed to at that age. So, yeah. Did you do drugs as a kid? No, we, I, we was, I was an athlete, man. So I, we you stayed out of it. Yeah, we didn't. Um, we wasn't really, we wasn't exposed to that, right? Because the stuff that was happening back when I grew up, we didn't, it, it's not this new age stuff with these kids in high school, they're doing drugs. Like it, it wasn't that ever. Yeah. Um, for us, it was like, we, we saw what the crackheads look like. So it was no like, oh, I'm gonna try that drug because the crack edge were, you know, running crazy. around yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. So that was like growing up as a kid, you're like, I'm never doing that. Yeah. You know, they run around in the neighborhood naked and jumping on cars and stealing, you know, TVs and everything else. You're like, I'm not ever doing that. Yeah. You know, so like drugs wasn't a part of, you know, at least us kind of growing up. Did you ever have a scenario where you felt like, obviously you were a bigger dude. I'm guessing by 14, 15 years old, you're already just a man. Yeah. Was there ever a scenario where you felt like you had to protect your mom? I did, no, I did, I did, I did. Um, she had a boyfriend. Um, <laughs> God, I never, I never even told this story, but I was uh, 14. I remember I told you we we went to go stay in like a rundown motel six or eight <laughs> or whatever it was. And she had a boyfriend at the time. He was a, he was a uh, what did he do? He was a barber or something like, he was, you know, whatever. So uh, I was 14, I just started to get some size on me. And, you know, he um, he also sold drugs. He sold, my mother's boyfriend sold drugs. And um, I told him like, hey, look, I don't care what you do, but keep it away from my sister and my mom. You're like, if you go, go do your thing somewhere else, don't bring it around here. And you know, he had a problem with a 14 year old kid telling them that, right? So uh, we're in this little motel, six or eight, I can't remember. It was on Allentown Road in, in PG County, Maryland. Um, and we were in the room and he kind of got in my face and said, you know, kid, what you going, what, what are you going to do about it? And I said, you know, practice, don't bring those drugs around my mother and my sister. And if you're going to do your thing, do it away from here, but don't bring it around. And that's the last time I'm going to tell you. He said, you telling me? And I just beat him up. I beat my mother's boyfriend up. Um, and I remember I was I was jumping on him and I had him in a chokehold, literally like putting him out to sleep. I was choking him. And my mom and sit there to grab me off of him. Uh, but I was I was very, very protective. I was very, very protective that way. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, <laughs> people probably just know better, right? Like, we're not gonna mess with Sean because He's 17 and 230 pounds yeah. of granite, right? <laughs> yeah, well, then I was only 14 then. But yeah. um, but back in back in our culture where I grew up in that grew up at in PG County Maryland and DC, like fighting was a very like it was very normal. We had 
you know, professional boxers around my neighborhood. And there was guys who could have been like a world greats that came out of my neighborhood and just kind of got caught up into that life and never really made it. But um, yeah, I used to fight. I used to fight a lot when, when I was a kid. A yeah. lot. Yeah. You ever kill anybody? No, no, no nothing crazy like that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you know of. <laughs> no, I, they all lived as far as I know of. Yeah. So coming out of high school, you get, I'm assuming you're heavily recruited yeah. by D1. You go to college. You end up becoming one of the top linebackers in the country yeah. in college. You get drafted when you're how old? So you got to be three years in. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so when I went to the University of Maryland, I committed as a junior in high school. I got offered my sophomore year in high school, and I finally committed my junior, junior. year. But remember I told you, like our, our living situation and circumstances, um, I didn't want to cut I didn't want the coaches to come and see where we lived. And so the, I declined for them, you know, and and the head coach there now, um, Mike Loxley, who's the head coach in Maryland, he was a running back coach. And so we still talk about this to this day. And I didn't tell them to years after why I didn't want them to come to my home. Um, cause I lived, you know, it was, it was, we were, it was bad, you know? And so I just didn't want them to see how I was living. I was embarrassed. Um, and we, we still talk about that, talk about that now, but I committed as a, uh, I committed as a junior. Yeah. Yeah. Who else was trying to pick you up? I had letters from everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I had letters from everybody, but so we talk about like, you know, my upbringing and I, my friends, coaches and family and stuff like that from the area, like there was no way I was going anywhere else. Like I grew up 20 minutes from from College Park, University of Maryland. And I was like the first one from my high school that ever went Division One. And so I was like, man, look, you, you don't have to be a top recruit in the country and leave and go to Penn State. You don't have to be a top recruit in the country, leave and go to Miami or Alabama or, you know, one of these other schools. I stayed home, and then after me, then a lot of a lot of these local kids started, you know, top recruits started to all stay home. So it kind of started a, a trend. Yep. Two thousand five, you're drafted. Yeah. By the Chargers, right? From being the being the new guy, the new linebacker, the rookie, to like. One of the guys, how long does that take you to where to where you know inside you're like, I'm one of the top dogs in the league? Is that three years? I, I no, man. I walked in. I mean, you knew, you know, it, it, I was, um, so I, you know, I was talking to uh, one of the, the guys up, uh, one of my best friends I played with, DeQuell Jackson, uh, played linebacker with the Cleveland Browns and the Colts, right? I played with him at the University of Maryland. He reminded me of something the other day that I totally forgot of. So when you're when you're a freshman in in school, you know you got to stand up, and all the juniors and seniors and upperclassmen, you got to stand up and you got to introduce yourself, right? You got to introduce yourself to who you are, where you're from, what position, and how many stars you had coming out of high school, whatever. So all the freshmen had to go around at Maryland and stand up and tell everybody who they are. What well, came to me. And I stood up and I told everybody in, in the whole team, everybody in there, that, you know, I'm Sean Merriman, coming from out of Frederick Douglass High School up in Marlboro, Maryland. You know, I was a three or four star recruit, forgot what I what it was. I'm gonna be at three years and I'm going first round and leaving school early. This is what I said in front of the entire team. And I got a lot of slack for that because, you know, you're a 16, uh, 17 year old kid. Right. And you got these juniors and seniors in there who at the time there was no I think there was no first round picks from Maryland. It might, might have been one um, in the early second or something like that or Chad Scott, something. It was a long time ago, but it was nobody that went like in the top 10, top 15 ever from, yeah. from my understanding. Um, but I stood up in front of the whole team and I said, you know, I told them who I was, where I came from. And I'm going to be here three years and I'm leaving school early, going first round in front of the whole team. And, you know, some people looked at it like it was crazy. Some people looked at it was cocky or arrogant. But I f knew who I was and what I was. Mm. I knew that I could not work everybody. I knew that I would put my body through more than anybody else would. I knew that my physical abil ability and God-given ability was going to take me to a place. And then my work ethic was going to take me to a whole nother place. Yeah. 
And I knew that at 17 years old. And that never really sat well with everybody, but I was that confident in what I what I what I did. Um three years later, first round, number 12 pick overall. Um, and so I walked in my my rookie year. And a lot of guys will tell you this, and LT and some of those uh, you know, Hall of Fame guys that I got a chance opportunity to play with, they'll tell you I walked in the, into that locker room with that same amount of confidence. I walked in there with that same attitude, like I that that 17 year old kid that knew that he was going to go first round. And this wasn't I didn't think I was better than anybody. I just knew what I was capable of. And that, you know, kind of overshadowed everything, a lot of other stuff. You had that lights out mindset. Yeah. That's what we're going to start calling it. It's like the Mamba mentality, right? It's a lights out mentality. At that time, you get drafted 12th. Is this a phone call that you get? Yeah. Tell me about that phone call. Yeah. So I um so I got invited to go to the draft to be there in New York. Um but I saw the horror stories of guys go, thinking they're going to go, the not, yeah. you know, go to the top 10, top 15, or in the first round, guys not getting picked the first day. I mean, because you don't know, right? You just don't know around that draft period. Yeah. So much talk and so much speculation and anything can happen, you know? Yeah. A team that was very high on you could, in 24 hours, be not high on you anymore. Yeah. So I said, no, I declined. I stay home. I rented a mansion, a nice big house in in Maryland. Oh, you did. Oh, I rented like a ten, a fifteen bedroom mansion, like for friends, family, coaches. Everybody came over. Um, and I just watched. We watched the draft. And we had the local news and stuff set up in the living room, and it was it was a better atmosphere. Better atmosphere. I you know I wasn't gonna be sitting there with a camera in my face the whole time, wondering sweating. what happened, sweating. <laughs> yeah. And back then, you got to think too. Back when I got drafted, the first round used to be remember like eight hours, eight hours long. Oh yeah, it was like all it was every all day. day. It was like fifteen minutes or something. Yeah, yeah. every pick. Yeah, yeah. Now it's you know two hours. You can get through the whole draft in two three hours. Yeah. Now back then it was like a ten hour day. So I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going there with a camera in my face. And somehow I slipped to the end of the, end of the first Aaron Rodgers, right? That came out, you know, end up was supposed to go top and end up going in what 20 something, right? And he he didn't get picked like six, seven hours in. He was still in the first round. So I was like, no way in hell I'm getting that happen. So I stayed home and uh and I thought I was gonna get drafted by the Cowboys originally, because I met with Jerry Jones and Bill Parcells, and they told me they were going to draft me at the 11th pick out if I was still there. So I met with them in Dallas, pre-draft. Mm. Uh, but then again, you know, I, I, when I met with um, – I met with the then Redskins. I met with uh, the Detroit Lions. I met with three or four other – they all told me they would, if I was going to be there, they would draft me. But, you know. And Dallas was the first uh, – like the lowest was pick. A, Dallas was the 11th pick before the Chargers at 12. Yeah. So, but that was the lowest one that you had met with. No, the Redskins had a ninth pick and Lions had the tenth. So all three of them passed. All three, yeah. So all three, all three passed. Um, but I thought I was actually going to go three to Cleveland, uh, but they got Braylon Edwards from Michigan wide receiver. So I knew I was going to go somewhere in the top fifteen. I mean, you know, I'm not going to sit around and like everybody, everybody passed me up and pissed off. Like, come on, dude, you're on the, you're on the top fifteen. Relax, right? Um, but. I remember the call that I got because the teams that did pass up on me in that time, the first call I got was from Marty Schottenheimer. So actually, that wasn't the first call. One of my homeboys, one of my boys had called me around the seventh pick and asked me if I was watching the draft. I flipped. Like, dude, the draft, the draft is live. And he's asked me. He called me and said, hey, are, are you watching the draft? Are you at the draft? I said, bro. I am about to get drafted. What are you calling me for? The, the only call that I want is from the team that's about to draft me. Are you crazy? I flip like I, I don't think I, I'm trying to think. I didn't talk to him for weeks or months after that. I just like <laughs> you can't be that ridiculous, are right? You watching this draft? I was like, you watching my? He asked me if I'm watching the draft. For him. I'm like, what are you doing calling me today? Like for what? <laughs> Maybe to congratulate, but not before the call. You know. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that, that, that happened around the seventh pick, and I think uh, Minnesota Vikings had the seventh pick, which would have made sense for me to get that call because Mike Tice was the head coach. Mike Tice w went to the University of Maryland. So I thought I could end up at seven in Minnesota or six or whatever it was. Um, so anyway, when when um, the Chargers were up and, and Marty Schottenheimer called me, he um, at this point, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, ha I'm excited, I'm, I'm happy, but I'm also pissed off because of the, All those other the teams that – Pass you, yep. pass you. 
So at this point, he asked me, he said, um, he said, hey, you ready to be a, a charger? I said, y'all ready to draft me? Because I'm ready to get out there and get to work, you know? And they called my name and I was on a flight that night to San Diego. So. What's that? I mean, what's that feeling like? I mean, is, is that is that the pivotal moment that you go, man, everything I've worked for my entire life paid off? Is it that call? Is it once you make a roster? Like, what's the what's the moment for well, you? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm within the first, you know, window. First round, so you know you're gonna make the roster. You gotta, if you go first round, and you don't make the roster. You almost gotta try not to, right? <laughs> you really gotta try to put in no effort. Yeah. Um, I think that during that time, you ever seen like the movies where things turn into like a blur and it's not like a crowd and everything is just slowed down, it's blurry. It's yeah. you had a, a lot of back noise. Yeah. It was like one of those things and I hung up the phone and everybody else is jumping up and down. You hear your friends, family, and coaches, and you're watching the TV. It's like out of body. You're it's almost out, watching you're of, yourself. You're, yeah. Exactly. That's the word I'm looking for. It was almost an out-of-body experience because it hasn't even hit you all the work that you put in to get there. Because yeah. you're so caught up in that that time. They're about an uh, NFL team. You're at, I grew up watching all these big players in, in since I was a kid. An uh, NFL team is about to call your name right now for you to be an NFL player. You're going in the first round, right? 12th overall. And so you're trying to, you're trying to just understand like what in the hell is happening at that moment. And it don't, it doesn't hit you until I landed in San Diego. And I walk into the facility, had their, they had their, you know, people there waiting on me to pick me up at the airport, take me in there. You go into the building, shaking everybody's hand. And then when you get home, get to your hotel that night, and it all like sinks in. You're like, dude, I just this 24 hours has been crazy. You can't even you can't even put those 24 hours into words because it happens like boom, 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 boom. So you never really have time to process. Have time to yeah. process everything just yet. And so I don't think it really hit me. It didn't even hit me when I walked into the team facility and met all the coaches and some of the players that were there. It didn't hit me until I got to my hotel room that night and I sat down and there was nobody around me. Took a breath. That took a breath. And I was like, Man. dude, I just got drafted 12th overall. You know, so that that part is is pretty, you know, pretty amazing. You talk about big players growing up. I mean, who are who are your guys? Who are the guys that you idolized? Uh well, I wore 56 because of uh Lawrence Taylor. Obviously, that was my favorite. He's your guy. And even even before I really started watching um football, I watched him because it was it was it was something that intrigued me as a kid to watch like a, a grown man put fear in other grown men, like put like you were people were scared of him. Yeah, and whether they want to publicly admit it or not, whatever you you knew when somebody put that fear into another person, and I was like, man, th these are all grown men. These are all big guys, offensive tackles that are three hundred plus pounds. Why are they scared of this one human being, right? What what why what makes him so? I started really hone in on, and I watched him. I watched Lawrence Taylor run people down from the back and and um, run over people, and the trash talking and just the constant intimidation, and then being able to back it up every single time, nonstop for four quarters, sixty minutes, just off the ball, off the ball, in your face, hitting you in the mouth over, and I would just watched him. I, I watched him so much that I didn't even really know football. I didn't even understand the game of football. I only understood the fear that this one particular human being was putting in everybody. And I just wanted to see everything he did to when he came off the ball and he was run through, running through blockers. And I was like, I learned that. I didn't know anything about plays. You knew linebackers. Right? I just knew yeah. linebackers. I, didn't, I couldn't tell you what a wide receiver did. I couldn't tell you what a quarterback <laughs> did. I couldn't tell you what any, anything part of football was. I just knew that there's one person like in in instill fear into other people and what he did for four quarters. And I emulated that. And then I got a chance to meet LeVar Arrington in high school. He came when he came down, got drafted by Penn State, went to the uh from Penn State, went to the Redskins. Um, I convinced his younger brother to come play basketball with me in my high school. Um, so that's how I got close to LeVar and then got really close with Ray Lewis. I played um, with his younger brother, Keon Lattimore at the University of Maryland, played running back. So I got really close with Ray. So I was I was fortunate to be around some very marquee guys. And, you know, LeVar and then Ray, they they saw something in me, 
right? And out of all the players that they've been around and 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 all this stuff, they took me under their wing. They didn't have to because they didn't know I was going to be, you know, Sean Lights Out Merriman. Yeah, I was a freshman, you know, and well, I was in high school then, and then I was a freshman and sophomore at the University of Maryland. You don't know that someone's going to be the twelfth pick overall, and they're going to go to multiple Pro Bowls and stuff. So they saw something in me that I will forever be thankful for because they they sped my like knowledge of of the game of life um you know how to you know deal with certain situations when it come to family and stuff like that because they were already in it so they took me under their wing and, and told me all this stuff and spent time with me they did they had they didn't have to do that so i'm still to this day i'm no matter i'm not 40 dude i still that 17 16 year old kid is still extremely thankful for for them taking that time with me Who's your top five linebackers of all time in order? Inside or outside or just linebackers in general? In general. I'm going to go L LT is one. And then Ray Lewis is is number two. Um, Yeah, I guess you got – you can put – depending on how, when you, how, how long you want to go back, but, you know, the Junior Sal is going to be up there with me. Dick Buckus, obviously, is going to be up there. Um, You can put anyone up there from the steel curtain. Any one of them, um, you know, John uh, Brian in there. What's that? Or Locker? Yeah, you could put you could put Lack. You put Brian or Lack up there, uh, and that's just from that time. And I and I judge a linebacker core and group by like every ten years. So the ten years I'll put them in this bucket. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like from two from like two thousand ten to two thousand twenty. If you look at that, and I put like Patrick Willis up there. You know, I'll put you know a lot of those guys like to play in that in that era. Probably James Harrison, right? Yeah. James, the James Harrisons and uh, like uh, I used to love uh, Joey from um, the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, Joey Porter. Yeah, yeah. So you know, like I, it's certain guys from like different times that I, I go by every ten years. That's why when people are like, oh, who's it? I'm like, do you got to from two thousand to two it's different games? Yeah. It's a different game, and yeah. you know, like two thousand, two thousand ten, nobody's better than Ray Lewis. Yeah, it just wasn't. Yeah, um, you look at the years before that, from ninety to from you know t that time, you know, LT, right? You you saw you Derek Thomas. You, so you start to when you really know the game, you, you can every from the seventies. I can tell you who my top five from the seventies from Buckus area all the way to the eighties to the nineties, and I'll you know kind of you know sing like Mike Singletary, right? You can those guys again in the eighties. So you, I got my top five out of out of every era. Who's your favorite? Who who would you say are like your top three to five today that are playing? Um, top uh, Fred Warner. I, I love watching BYU, baby. Yeah, I love watching Fred. Um, Is he your guy? Are you guys friends? You and Fred? Um, no, no. But I I read somewhere when he was coming out that I was one of his one of his favorite players to watch uh, growing up. Patrick, you know Queen. I love love, love watch Patrick Queen and um, Roquan Smith. Yeah, both of those guys. Um, yeah, man, you got, you know, you got some, you got some dogs out here, man, are just really killing it still. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about your, I think there were two moments in your career yeah. that you could consider were pretty low, mm -hmm. right? The first one's 2006, mm -hmm. your band, four games, PEDs. Do you think that this band was justified? Um, Yes and no. And this is why I say yes, because the NFL has a rule that whatever you put in your body, regardless of if it's a mistake or if it's tainted supplements, it doesn't matter. It's on you. Right. So by rule, they were right. I think that uh, back when I got suspended, I thought it was unfair because you had a lot of these track stars and like different people getting suspended for like seeing Victor Conti and going through this Balco stuff and and I was like, hold on, I didn't, I didn't see any doctors. Like, here go my supplement right here over the counter here. And they were coming back telling me, like, it doesn't matter, you took it. And I said, well, this wasn't on the ban list last year. Well, it, it is this year, and it's your responsibility for looking at the ban list every year. Because I always thought, just to be quite honest, I always thought steroids was needles. I, I thought that, you know, from what I knew about steroids, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, if I'm not doing needles, that's not steroids. I never knew you can get suspended for something that was over the counter. Yep. That was just a, orally. Yeah, orally, yep. that was an illegal supplement or illegal anything that was like not a needle because that's what I knew about that, you know, stuff. And 
So, I, and I kind of, it was at a time where all these track stars and everybody were getting suspended from like seeing doctors and going up seeing facilities and clinics. And I got thrown in it with them. I remember, I, I'll never forget to this day, um, doing my suspension. It was right around the time with Barry Bonds and like all these track stars. And and I was like, man, hold on. I, I didn't. I didn't go see anybody. I don't. I don't have any doctors for this stuff. I didn't go see a performance coach or nobody. I don't. I, I don't even know about this life that y'all, you guys are putting me into. Um, and then you know, I think the the biggest thing, probably the lowest point, that all of your work, right? Just tell, talk about my life and where I come from and what I had to do to get there, is negated. Everything because of that, right? And so. Because the first thing people want to do, no matter what, if somebody got money, he's not, he, oh, how you get that money? And it, you, you, you can't say, hey, I woke up at six every morning. I woke up at five. I worked 12 hour days. I dedicated. I sacrificed. I was disciplined. And that's how I got wealthy. Or that's how I got rich. You can't say that because it's people don't want to hear that. They don't care about you. They just care that, oh, you got money. How'd you get it? So yeah, it was lucky. It was, it was lucky you, who yeah. gave it to you, yeah. who, who passed it down to you. You can never say you got there by just sheer hard work and whatever. They don't understand that. Yeah. So they want to they want to see that you hit some lotto or some magic lucky thing that happened to you. They don't want to hear that you work 12 hours a day for, for years, right? They don't want to do that. And so the same thing when you work out like crazy and you like, even me now, I'm 40, man. Like, this is me. Like, this is who I look like for the past almost 20 years of my life. I've always been a meathead. I've always been in a gym. I, I'm still in the gym six days a week. I still spar with fighters. I still take care of my body like I, I could possibly line up on a Sunday and play, right? Even though I can't, but I, I take care of my body like I can. Um, but somebody say, oh, what do you take it? Well, I post almost every day in the morning. My, my favorite quote in the morning at like 4.30, 5 o'clock, gym before anything else. That's what I post on Twitter almost every day, right? So obviously people know I'm going to the gym because – I post it almost every day. Um, but if somebody see you, like, oh, what are you taking? Or what are you doing? It was like, well, I'm taking six hours, I mean, six days a week, an hour, 15 minutes in the gym. That's what I'm taking. It tends to. Right? And yeah. so, but again, you can't, so you go out there and I always stayed after practice for extra sprints, work on pass rushing moves, got extra days in a lifting. I've always been like that. And every teammate or everybody I've been around can always say they've never seen me out of shape since I was a kid. It just, it's not a part of me. But somebody who don't work like that and not don't they don't know that lifestyle, they, they're not disciplined in that way, will say, okay, shit, he took, he, he took steroids. I'm like, okay, well, you know, like there's plenty of people that took steroids and never made the NFL team, right? <laughs> I'm just or, or look like this. I'm like, you know, that is very possible that you, you don't just take steroids and become a, you know, I was the number one player coming out of DC, Maryland, Virginia in high school, you know, and I was all ACC, all American. I was, you know, all of that before this. I was rookie of the year before I got suspended. When I got suspended in 06, guess what I did the following in 07? I came back and made another Pro Bowl, another double digit sack year, because it's just who I was. But when you, when you do that, and I'm not saying that people are completely wrong for having that mentality, but I think that most people can't fathom somebody being so disciplined, their work ethic being so insane that they can look a certain way, play a certain way, live a certain way, because it's, they, they can't imagine being that disciplined. How did you, I mean, this obviously affected you to an extent, yeah. right? Initially, I'm sure the media is saying, hey, Sean, Sean Merriman, this and that, and drugs and all the right, and they're yeah. not they're they're discrediting essentially your entire life up to that yeah. point. How do you let that go? Like you, you don't you you. So you start to realize that there's people that just don't like you, right? Or people that just have whatever against you. There's nothing you can do. They just needed something to hate you for. And they needed some trash to talk. Maybe a opposing rivalry, or, you know, something. They needed something to say anyway. But I think that. You start to look at over time the people with that mentality, right? Who just will hang on to this, hang on to that. Mind you, it doesn't matter if I'm in the gym six days a week. It doesn't it does not matter? I still people. I mean, once in a blue moon, you'll have some idiot on social media like, "Oh, do you got some suspended for steroids?" I'm like, "Bro, it's, uh, that's like almost 18 years ago." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm 40 now. Um, we got a ton of businesses. I got you know going on. Like I've a, I still have a very very disciplined lifestyle, very. 
And you have to be when you have a lot going on, right? You got to get your hour and 15 minutes in the gym. You got to, my days are blocked off in 30 minute periods every day, six days a week, well, six days a week, 30 minutes. I got something, I got something every 30 minutes, uh, which is again, living a, a disciplined lifestyle that some people just like, they can't imagine living like that because they go on to brunch with their friends at 12, 12 to four. Yeah. You know, they're going to hang out. They just can't, they can't imagine it. You know, they just can't imagine waking up at 5.30 or 4.30 in the morning and going to the gym six days a week or having 12 hour days and being able to go spar and just like live a different lifestyle. Yeah. They can't imagine it. So, yeah. but you, as long as you know, like who you are and cause I'm so consistent on me and what I do that over time, those people just fall off and they won't even really mean much anyway. That's a great perspective. The, the other moment was in 2009. You had a, I mean, what would end up, end up eventually becoming a career ender, right? This Achilles injury. Yeah. When that happened, I mean, what was the first thing that went through your mind? Did you think I can get back from this? Oh, you know, when I told when I told my knee, I had a fully reconstructed knee in 2008 that I played yeah, on. Yeah, the year before, right? Yeah, yeah, the year before that I played on, probably played on too long that I should have had surgery on and I didn't. Um, and I came back from that and I was okay. But what happened was I started to compensate from that knee to my ankle to my Achilles, and I partially tore it first. I tore ten or fifteen percent, so it didn't just snap just yet. And then over time, I tore another 10 to 15 cent percent, another 10 to now I'm all the way down to like 50 percent of my Achilles torn. But when I was playing and running around, like nobody knew how bad of a shape I was in. You know, they just saw that the decline. They were like, oh, yeah, it was the steroids. Now they do. Like, first of all, there's no sign that you, you tear your Achilles from steroids. I was like, that's that's a, a myth. But two, um, I was I'm and still is I'm, I'm a person that don't I don't complain. Right. I'm just not a complainer. Whatever life throws you, you, you work on it, you figure it out and then you move the hell on. Like that's my attitude towards everything. So I wasn't around like screaming about my Achilles all the time and how bad that my Achilles was until it eventually popped. Um, and then any you ask any explosive athlete, and I don't care what sport, once you pop your Achilles, that's that's it. You, you practically, in a sense, you lose your ability to explode. You know, that was such a big part of my game that even when I came back and I remember watching film, I was like, damn, who was that dude? Like, I was watching film and I could not, I was like, man, I, I would normally go out there and run circles around this offensive tackle and I just can't do it anymore. So I was good enough to stay on the field, but I wasn't good, I wasn't great enough to be elite anymore. That over time, it just kind of wore me because I was so used to going out and just dominating on game day. And I, my body wasn't able to do that, do that anymore, which ended up causing me to retire. The Buffalo Bills, man, actually, um, uh, Doug Welly, who was the GM, assistant GM at that time, they had asked me to come back because I actually just came back around and start playing decent, you know, playing well again. So they asked me, they asked me to come back and I just knew that I was done. Like I wasn't the same player anymore. I couldn't live with the fact that I couldn't consistently go out there and take over games. I couldn't be that guy anymore. So I, I had already set my mind of like, man, I, I got TV to do. I got this lights out stuff to do. Like I already, I literally moved my mind completely away from playing football. The, the last game I walked out of that building after I packed my locker up and I never thought about playing again. Ever. That was it. You were, how old were you then? 27? 28. 28? Yeah. 28. And another, I mean, you play at that level for one or two more years, you're in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. 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 I was, um, I think I finished around 50 sacks in seven years. So I think that, you know, eight, if I had, you know, eight or nine or ten healthy years, or not even that, if I had six healthy years, that would have put me in like, you know, 80 sacks or so uh, in eight years, which is, you know, Hall of Fame numbers. So that act, that part actually bothered me for a while because I think that when you – obviously you got your team accolades. Like I would take a Super Bowl ring over a, jack, a gold jacket in a second. 
Yeah. You know, I would do that in a second. But when you don't reach that pinnacle of being a champion, the next thing you start looking for is the individual accolades because we all want to be recognized for being one of the best of what we did. Um, so that actually bothered me for some time because, you know, everybody who I played with or played against, like they were up for like the Hall of Fame. And I was like, damn, you know, especially at my at my peak, I was like, I was considered the best at what I did at that yep. time. Yep. And not just like one of, it's, you know, you can argue that I was the best defensive player for some years in the NFL. And so, um, and so that part of it's like, man, because you want to, that was always my thing. I wanted to be the best at what I did. And that gold jacket was like a recognition of you being the best at what you did. Okay. And so to know that I wasn't going to have the opportunity to get that, I would say about a good two years that really from two years when I retired, because you at the four-year mark is where you're up for it. So at the two-year mark, I was like, I'm not going to just don't even, you know, because I was going to other people's Hall of Fame speeches and their other people's stuff. And I'm like, I just, just don't even think about it. It ain't happening. And I just moved on from it. Is there a chance it still happens because they take into account your injuries? Like, have you ever seen somebody go into the Hall of Fame that only played five, six years? Terrell Davis had, you know, a good four to six year run. I think it was somewhere around it. But he also won a Super Bowl or two. And and he had, I think, a 2,000 yard rush a year. And it's happened. It's happened. I just, uh, for me, anything dealing with football, especially at this point, is just icing on the cake. Yeah. For me, like, yeah, I got a 14 year old son. So, like, I, I think f for him, that would be cool. Um, I've, I've moved on from it. I don't really, I don't really care as much. I, but I do think that for my son, I think that would, that would be cool. Something he would, he would enjoy. Last football question. What was the best player of your career? Best play that you ever made mm. in, in the NFL specifically? I would say, um, my really just my like my coming into the NFL moment playing against Peyton Manning, um, where I really got put on the map. I had three sacks that game, but it was it was one play um, that I drove the guard to tackle back, like just pushed him back like a like a kid, and I got Peyton by the legs. Uh, he didn't know what in the hell happened because it was so quick, and it was like a big tomahawk swipe at his at his legs. Nowadays, that's a that's a penalty, a fine, and everything else. You can never do that now. But at that time, when I got him, uh, it was going looking, and I just saw it a few weeks ago. Going back, looking at it now, it was like an impressive, like dude, that's some serious. You know, I think it, I might even got Jeff Saturday, or one of the, one of the more known guys. Yeah, he's a uh, Hall of Famer, right? Yeah, Hall of Famer. Yeah. You know, if it wasn't Jeff, it was the guard or something like that. Yeah. But um, that that play was that play was pretty pretty impressive when I go back and look at it. Being too like a young rook, the, how I was and how dominating that that play was, it had to that have been pretty pretty crazy. Do you have any non negotiables for your son? Um, you know it's funny. I was uh I talked to a lot of like athletes, dads who son who kid plays. Yeah. And um, we, we're kind of in a tough position because, like, when I go to his games, I go to his practices, whatever, like, the coaches, people who are around want me to be more involved. And I'm there, and I'm like, no, no, I want to come be a spectator because because he has he has enough pressure on him already by being my son. He has my last name. And so he, he's going to have those plays, those days, those games where people just want to come and show him up because he's my son. Yeah. Right? And so he's, he's he plays quarterback. Um, out of this world talent, he's six one, you know, got that DNA, you know, with him and he's starting to kind of come into his own. Um, I just dropped him off at the IMG Academy like two weeks ago in Tampa for the wow. week. And wow. so, you know, he's he's very he he has a real shot to be really good if he keeps working. I think my non negotiable with him is just his work ethic. I, I never really whether he was the best or won every game or had a great performance. I didn't I always told him even as a kid, I don't care. But if you go out there and your efforts your efforts not there, I'm not coming to the game. I'm not coming to support this mess. I'm not. Cuz that's one that's one thing you can always control. You can you control your effort. You going to throw an interception, he plays quarterback, he's going to make some bad reads, he's going to do some stuff. But if I start seeing him hang his head and not give effort for the rest of that game, I'm out. That that that's what a that's what I draw the line for me. 
I don't want to. I don't want to go down there and overcoach him, tell him everything to do. I want to. I want to be the dad and kind of sit back. And so my my non negotiable with him is just effort. If I start to see that effort slip, I'm 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 not supporting anything else mm -hmm. you're doing. That that part to me is my non negotiable. Mm -hmm. Sean, this was a pleasure. Um, I want to close with this. Okay, I want you to look into your camera that's over my shoulder here, and I want you to share. There's, there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of people listening to this today that are younger, all sorts of different backgrounds, different upbringings, right? But they want to be elite. That's something. Yeah. Okay. You're one of the only people in the world, you know, part of the less than 1% that's become elite, one yeah. of the best in the world. What's your words of advice to young people that have aspirations of being elite? I, I would say this to, to the younger people out there, like, do not measure yourself as when it comes to being elite. Don't measure yourself on how elite the next player is, or the next guy, or the next girl if you push yourself to your very best, your limit, whatever your your elite is, that is elite in your own right. You're going to have people that's better than you. You're going to have people that's more physically gifted, faster, taller, more athletic. Um, I would tell any of, of the younger generation out there, you push your what's your elite. You have a, a level of elite to you. You have a level to your fastest, your strongest, your smartest, your effort. So push yourself to be your elite, not everybody else's elite. So that that would be my my lesson out there to everybody. Amen. Sean, thanks for coming on the roller coaster. Got it, brother. Appreciate it. That's a wrap. Thanks for having me. All right.